Good. One fear I have of wearing masks, it is muffled your amens. <laughs> Don't let that occur. All right, these things are something to get excited about and uh, something that we certainly can say, amen, I agree, I'm grateful for the mansions on the hilltop, I'm grateful that when we all get to heaven, we'll have a lot of rejoicing and things to experience, I'm grateful that someday uh, we'll see that golden daybreak, we'll see our Savior in the skies as we go to meet Him and to ever be uh, with him, and we just get the opportunity here uh, to be encouraged once again with these wonderful scriptural truths. Well, we talked about a few different uh, aspects regarding the end times. Uh, we've looked at the rapture, we've looked at the judgment seat of Christ, and now this morning we want to look at the marriage of the Lamb. The marriage of the Lamb, something that I find is a subject or a topic that is referred to uh, uh, somewhat often, and yet it's very obscure and how we understand it and how we uh, really define this particular event and, and uh, 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 see it uh, played out and see it come to pass uh, in that moment that the Lord determines it so uh, to be. And I trust that through the, uh, the insights that the Lord will provide us here today that you will uh, go out of here uh, not only understanding the marriage of the Lamb a little bit better, but also looking forward to the wedding day. Uh, that's just uh, uh, something that we uh, really can uh, 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 certainly relate a little bit uh, with uh, uh, Brother uh, Alex and Sister Jess, as well as uh, uh, Darrell and Morgan, if you'll remember them as well. Uh, Darrell and Morgan are going to beat uh, Alex and Jess to the marriage altar by one week, all right? Uh, uh, so we get to uh, uh, see these things uh, happen in real life, but we also get to anticipate what's going going to take place uh, in, um, in real life as well, all right? It's just going to be in a different kind uh, of realm, if you will. I want you to take your Bibles this morning, go to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 19. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm talking fast. I am excited already about this message, and I recognize there's probably uh, going to take some doing to get through it, okay? So I'm kind of, uh, do I speed right down past it, or do I uh, take my time and get what we can? Uh, I don't know. I'm just going to have to let the Lord lead uh, on that. But one thing I can say, it will definitely help if you listen quickly. Uh, if you keep those ears going and uh, uh, stay in tune. I know it's starting to get a little warm in here. Uh, that's uh, just because we, we want to give you the illusion that it's a, a very warm day outside so that uh, when we baptize a few later, uh, they'll still feel good about it, all right? Uh, uh, just happens to be the coldest morning we've woken, woken up to in a while, right? Uh, but Revelation chapter 19, I'm going to start here with verse 1. Revelation chapter 19, verse 1, and after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he had judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Now you see these scriptural terms that they utilize in heaven. We ought to be practicing them here on earth so that we're good when we get up to heaven and be able to say them, right? Alleluia, Amen, uh, all those kind of good things. All right, now in verse 5, And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his saints, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. And notice this next statement. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. In verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. 
And then we'll finish here with verse 9. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And praise the Lord for the truth that we can read today, the truth that we can know today. And so we see these scriptural statements concerning uh, this marriage of the Lamb, this wedding that will occur uh, one day in heaven. And the idea of a marriage, the idea of a wedding, is something that most all of us are familiar with. Now, obviously, there's some differences in regards to maybe the specific traditions of one culture over another culture. We'll talk a little bit about that in regards to maybe the Jewish uh, uh, aspect of the wedding that would help depict this event a little bit better uh, for uh, us to really grasp and to really understand. But one of the things that I've been convinced of in studying this is this is an event that will happen. It will come to pass. There will be the marriage of the Lamb. And I think that's one of the things that sometimes we have difficulty when it comes to maybe the end times and the events of the end times. And, and we see some of those things as being, uh, you know, well, I hear it. I, I know that, that that's stated, but I don't necessarily understand whether or not it's really going to happen or if it's just a picture of what's going to happen or how it's going to happen and when and who and all these kind of other things. And and certainly there are some aspects of prophecy and prophetic things that is still uh, yet to be fully comprehended and fully revealed. Uh, one of the things that I'm grateful for in living in the day that we live in is that we can see the prophecies of the first coming of Jesus Christ and we can fully understand them. Because they all happen, just like they said. And things for the Old Testament saints that would have been a little bit of a mystery or a little bit obscure, uh, they, they didn't have that, that full comprehension because they lived before Christ came. Now that we are after uh, that event of the, re uh, of the uh, first coming of Jesus, we can see the full uh, fulfillment of those things and have a greater understanding. And one day we will understand fully and completely all there is to know about the future events. <laughs> and it's, uh, there's not going to be a lot of argument at that point regarding how they really occur. <laughs> because they'll have already occurred and they'll have already happened. And we can take uh, just uh, hope and, and, and peace today, uh, comfort in the fact that these are true sayings of uh, God. And so as we dive into this aspect of this wedding, and there's other places in scripture that we're going to look uh, in which uh, uh, the, the wedding is mentioned. There's some parables that Jesus taught regarding uh, the wedding feast and liking it unto the kingdom of heaven. Uh, there's the concept over uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 5 that we'll look at just a little bit later uh, where Jesus, uh, 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 where it's talked about the relationship between husband and wife, uh, but it also, it's, it's stated very specifically that it deals with Christ and uh, the church. And so uh, this is going to be one of those glorious events that we get to see, uh, glorious events that we get to experience. And uh, one of those things that uh, we don't have to like, oh man, I hope that doesn't happen sooner than later. You know, it's one of those things that I can't wait for this to occur much of like uh, when you uh, got married for those of you that are married and when those of you that are not married hopefully the mindset that you have towards uh, that event right uh, if you ask Alex how long how long before he's going to get married he will give you uh, such an answer that you'll go oh are you anticipating it or something? You know, are you ready for it? Is this going to really happen? And and uh, yes, uh, hopefully, uh, this is the, this is probably the only allotment that I think God may provide for us not wanting the rapture to occur. <laughs> not till after the wedding, okay? Let's wait to you know give us a chance to see it all happen and say I do and and kiss his bride, you know that kind of thing, right? But here, as we consider this marriage of the Lamb, I want you to. Really Really uh, uh, put the thinking caps on today a little bit because we're going to go through some facts and some information, but I want you to also just kind of place yourself in a position to be able to picture it because I believe this is, again, one of those things that will help provide us with some uh, uh, great motivation to live faithfully for our wonderful God. 
as we talk about here, the, the stages of the wedding, the stages of the wedding, I want to just mention a little bit regarding the Jewish wedding. The Jewish wedding. There was stage number one of the Jewish wedding that was considered the betrothal stage. The betrothal stage. Now, uh, please bear with us on some of the wording because we get today in, in, in our mindset, we have different understandings of different words. And uh, uh, sometimes we think of uh, a word like betrothal and you'll have all sorts of different uh, mindsets. Uh, uh, this is what it means. That is what it means. And one of the things that we like to uh, encourage here is the, uh, the process of getting to the marriage altar, utilizing uh, something like betrothal. Then I get the question all the time, what is betrothal versus dating versus courting versus all these things? That's another message that you can talk to me later about, all right? Or uh, another time we'll discuss those things. But, but the, 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 the overall uh, uh, aspect of it is we want our young people uh, to get to the marriage altar uh, uh, with the right person at the right time in a pure manner. And uh, we want the Lord to show himself strong in and through uh, those things. That's one of the reasons that I, uh, as a pastor, I like to pray for our young adults and, and uh, really petition the Lord to make sure uh, that he's preparing them and preparing the one that they are going to marry, uh, that that'll, the Lord will bring it to pass and the Lord will bring it uh, to, to, to the right time and the right place uh, when those uh, uh, individuals are ready and uh, the Lord will get glory and honor in and through that. And let me give you, uh, those of you that are still single and those of you that are uh, really anticipating that and hoping for that, let me, let me just encourage you this morning, keep trusting the Lord in that area. The Lord will work and he'll work mightily, all right? And, 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 and well, that's all I can say. I got to keep going, all right? So this stage one, betrothal, betrothal. Essentially, this is the stage of arranging of the marriage, arranging of the marriage. And, and as we're talking about Jewish uh, uh, wedding, uh, Jewish, Jewish practices, uh, uh, there is a, a little bit difference in how we do it in our Mar American Western culture. Uh, versus how the Jews uh, uh, practiced it, and many times uh, uh, long before a young man and young woman was even of marrying age, uh, there was some uh, understanding or some talk and some uh, contemplations uh, uh, that maybe those two would be the ones for uh, each other. And, and uh, we had a lot of parental involvement, especially father, and uh, it just carried forth into some things we can see uh, some of those principles in Scripture. Uh, but it was at this stage, in the betrothal stage, once the marriage was arranged, that a dowry was paid. A dowry was paid, and, and a, a, a bride price essentially was given. And, and uh, it's interesting to think through this a little bit, and we'll, we'll, we'll liken this unto some of the things of the marriage of the Lamb. This was also what we would consider as the engagement stage or the espousal. When they were espoused one to another, we see this in the life of Mary and Joseph, right? Uh, Joseph was espoused to Mary, and yet they weren't married yet. And yet they were engaged or they were committed to each other. And uh, it was a very serious commitment uh, that really, uh, if it was broken, there was a, it was much like more of what we would consider a divorce because uh, of the, uh, the practice that they had during that time. This was also the stage in which the preparation would take place and the bride uh, would make herself ready and, and things of that sort would take uh, uh, what, what happened during that particular particular stage then stage two would be the presentation stage the presentation stage and again I know this is different because it it's not exactly how we do things and and uh, that's okay right because just because we do it doesn't make it right <laughs> Uh, but rather just the, uh, the practice of the Jews. It was a presentation stage, and this was when uh, essentially the husband went and uh, claimed his bride or was able to uh, take, uh, uh, take his bride. It was the legal, there was a time in which the legal proof was presented, and far as why are you to marry this individual, uh, there's the opportunity in some of the uh, scenarios and situations that the wedding party would meet at the bride's house. There, uh, the groom would escort his bride to his own house and this was that stage of presentation and it was accompanied with great joy and great uh, merriment and and uh, there was that that time in which then the uh, the marriage uh, was consecrated and then verse stage number three was the wedding feast 
the wedding feast. This was the time of celebration and festivity. Uh, this was, a, uh, in some ways, a religious occasion that lasted for several days. And unlike what our typical scenarios and situations tend to show and demonstrate, uh, there was none of this uh, revelry and drunkenness and partying and all this kind of stuff. But this was a uh, something in which uh, honor and glory was given to the Lord and the recognition of this marriage was uh, celebrated. And in fact, uh, 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 Dr. Wilmington and his Wilmington's Guide to the Bible said it this way. He said, in the New Testament times, the length and cost of this supper, this stage three, this wedding feast, uh, they were determined by the wealth of the Father. And that's kind of interesting to note. He actually uh, personally believes and holds to the fact that therefore when the beloved Son, that's Jesus Christ, is married, the Father of all grace, our Heavenly Father, whose wealth is unlimited, right? Unlimited. Uh, will rise to the occasion by giving His Son and the Bride a hallelujah celebration. And he particular belie specifically believes that that is during the millennial reign of Christ. That's because it's going to last for a thousand uh, years. Now there's a few other thoughts along those lines uh, as well. And so now this is the idea of that Jewish wedding that happens. The Jewish wedding that takes place in the different stages uh, that they went through. Uh, and certainly as Jesus is teaching through this and as, as John is observing the things that are going on in heaven, he would have recognized uh, what the culture of that day would have been. And so anytime we're talking about a specific event that occurred during that culture, we want to know how did that culture celebrate a wedding? How did they uh, uh, practice this marriage thing? And that's what we see uh, from there. And the, so that helps us then to really gain the insights and understanding of what the marriage of the Lamb will be like. As we see here in Revelation chapter 19, it, it talks about uh, that uh, great whore that will be judged. In fact, in, in Revelation 17, we see that false bride uh, that is brought down. And isn't that interesting how the devil always has a counterfeit to offer, right? He's got a counterfeit uh, Bible. He's got a counterfeit church. He's got a counterfeit plan of salvation for your soul. He's got a, just anything the Lord has done, decreed, determined. The devil is trying to undo and trying to develop uh, some deceptive means to get others involved in that situation. So the Lord talks about the marriage of the Lamb. He has a bride especially prepared for his son, and therefore the world has an answer. The devil has an answer for that, the great whore, and thankfully she is brought down and uh, exposed and everyone is able to see uh, the true reality of that. You know, just like we have the Antichrist, right? He's an anti-Jesus. He's supposed to be uh, the Messiah, and yet he is something the devil has interjected in there. And we don't want to be caught up into that. So truthfully, thankfully, in, in, in Revelation chapter 19, we see the real bride, the pure bride, that will marry uh, Jesus Christ, uh, the Lamb of God. In verse 7, it talks about her making herself ready. It talks about then uh, that, that, that marriage supper in verse 9 occurring and so on and so forth. So here the heavenly wedding uh, is laid out. And let me let me let me utilize some of the things there uh, in the Jewish uh, system that would help us to recognize what is going on right now. Well, stage one, we talked about the betrothal. This is when the, the marriage is being arranged. This is when the dowry uh, has been paid. Uh, by the way, the dowry was paid was the blood of Jesus Christ. Our Savior gave of Himself to purchase us as the potential bride for uh, Himself. Uh, that betrothal stage is essentially what is happening right now. This is the time of preparation. This is the time of espousal. This is the time as that dowry has been paid and it's being placed uh, there at our account. This is the time in which all these things are starting to unfold and starting to come together in anticipation of that next stage, that presentation stage. And you know, here's the interesting thing. I think it's kind of neat the way the Lord does it. But you know, the presentation stage, I believe, is part of what occurs in the rapture. 
in the rapture when uh, the bride of Christ is presented there in heaven uh, before the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and um, we can talk about how uh, the Father, our, our Heavenly Father, is involved in arranging that. We can talk about uh, some other aspects of that, and I'll try not to get ahead of myself, all right? Uh, but here also, when we talk about the presentation, we talk about the preparation. After the rapture occurs, what is that next event that occurs in heaven for the saved? The judgment seat of Christ, right? What is occurring during the judgment seat of Christ? Things being tried by fire, giving an account for the things that we've done here on this earth. Well, what does that do that helps in that preparation of the bride for her groom? And so it's neat that that occurs, and then we'll see of the marriage of uh, the Lamb, which is spelled out there for us in Revelation 19, as well as that supper, uh, that wedding feast that is spelled out for us. Uh, you may think that the thousand years is part of that celebration. It can also be likened unto the honeymoon. <laughs> Don't get any ideas. <laughs> A thousand years of honeymoon. Could you imagine? I couldn't imagine paying for it, you know, but... <laughs> Wow! I mean, a time when the bride is going to be able to enjoy the marriage, the full marriage with her uh, groom. And then don't forget, and uh, we'll probably mention this again, but you know, there's also going to be the home. When our groom takes his home once and for all. And he was preparing a special city for his bride, the new Jerusalem. It's going to be amazing. It's something to look forward to. In fact, in Revelation chapter 21, you're right there pretty close. You might just want to turn over there and follow along as I read in verse 9. As John is really seeing as things are coming to an end and he's starting to see uh, just kind of that final end result of what is still going to be lasting. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, come hither and I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. There it is, the bride, the lamb's wife, just like uh, uh, as Revelation 19 mentioned. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And then you can read just all about that special city uh, in which the bride of Christ was found within. And man, that's just going to be something that we've never experienced ever before. It's going to be far greater than you can possibly imagine. I know we always talk about the mansion and we talk about the street of gold, right? Uh, but there is so much more there than just the mansion in the street of gold. I mean, just to think, I can't, I'm sorry, I'm excited. All right, it, it, let's get back here to the, 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 the notes, all right? And I'll try to follow suit. So let's go into the stipulations of the wedding, the stage of the wet, wet wedding, but the stipulations of the wedding. I want you to turn over with me uh, to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Again, we have a little bit of insights in regards to uh, just that general concept of the marriage uh, thing because uh, Jesus taught some parables and he utilized uh, the example of marriage in teaching through uh, some of those things that can help us uh, truly to uh, comprehend these things. But Matthew chapter 22 in verse 1, it says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Now that was something that would have certainly occurred within their culture, but I want you to also think about the idea that, listen, our king is making a marriage for his son, and we have an opportunity to be a part of that. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatling are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. 
But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servant, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him in outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now again, there's some, some other aspects regarding this parable that I think is important to understand. And one of the things that we easily see from it is the idea of sharing the gospel and being able to present others with the message of salvation, how some uh, will reject it and not respond, and some will treat those of the, 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 the messengers, the servants, they will treat them spitefully and even kill them. And we see the persecution of the, of the believer that, that, that can and, and may occur at different times. But we also see those that say, no, I don't want anything to do with it. I'm too busy. I have other things in my life. I, I, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to come to that wedding feast. And we see some of this as a, a, an invitation uh, to be saved, an invitation to respond to the gospel. Many are called, uh, but few are chosen. Many uh, are, are invited to salvation, but not all uh, come to Christ in uh, salvation. And then there's some that do respond. And we see that response and they're invited to the wedding and they come to the wedding, but they better come prepared with true uh, salvation or they will be uh, cast out. Now, as you keep that mindset or that concept of the wedding and, and we see the different things, we see the king uh, preparing uh, this wedding for his son. We see calling out the guests. We see the feast that is going to occur that many get to partake in. And, and we see uh, that still carrying over then into uh, this marriage of the lamb that one day uh, will Will occur and so who do we have involved in this wedding the participants first of all uh, the groom is who Jesus Christ some of you are paying attention this morning I think I've only said that a few times right uh, uh, that is one thing that nobody disagrees over the groom is Jesus Christ and the other thing that we're pretty confident about is the father of the groom uh, that is God the Father, uh, the, our Heavenly Father. He is the Father of the groom. And so we have Jesus as the groom, we have God as the Father, and we see the different workings that are going on in relation to this marriage of the Lamb that is already occurring. We see God inviting those that would come and be a part of uh, this wedding ceremony. Uh, God inviting those that would be a part uh, of even uh, the bride, all right? God inviting and arranging this feast and these things that will occur in regards to His Son, being the groom. We also see from Scripture that the best man is John the Baptist. <laughs> the best man is John the Baptist. Now, when we say the best man, we, we recognize what that really means, right? Uh, uh, as, as we make joke within the weddings, the best man is never the best man. It's always the groom. But for whatever reason, they deemed him the best man, all right? But when we talk about John the Baptist in John chapter 3 and verse 28, I think it's just, uh, again, ironic the way the scriptures all work together and helping provide us with the truth. He says, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, Sherlock, okay? <laughs> You married her, guess what? You're the bridegroom. The best man's not the bridegroom because he doesn't have the bride. And he says, but the friend of the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, that's what John considered himself. That's, I would say, kind of the idea of the best man, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. 
He must increase, but I must decrease. What a beautiful picture of John the Baptist giving to us in regards to this marriage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in the Jewish tradition, again, uh, we see that the bridegroom, he was that, just that, he was the friend of the groom. Many times he was instrumental in introducing the couple to each other or act as a go-between be, before the actual wedding. Uh, he would be the one that would kind of offer some of the gifts. He would be the one that would wait upon the couple during the wedding. He would be the one that would maintain proper terms between uh, the two parties and, and essentially was kind of the general organizer of the wedding. Uh, man, I tell you what, there's a different concept than what we're used to, right? Uh, uh, but this was that responsibility of the bridegroom, I mean, the, the best man, of uh, the friend of the uh, uh, bridegroom. And if you think about it, John the Baptist did just that. I mean, it's amazing to consider all the things that, that he was involved with during his ministry to help prepare the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the responsibilities that John the Baptist, the baptizer, was given was to baptize people, right? And in order then for the, the, to be saved or to be baptized, they had to be saved. So now they're saved and baptized individuals. And what is, the, what is John doing? He's presenting them to Jesus Christ to start what? The first New Testament church. You know where we're going now, don't you? <laughs> I mean, this is what John the Baptist did. This was his responsibilities. And we see uh, he was an excellent uh, a best man. And I believe that he'll be at the wedding of the marriage of the Lamb. And I believe he'll still probably be in that same position of best man. Then we have the invited guest as we see not only Revelation and in Matthew that is emphasized there and other places. Uh, we have there's, there's definitely people at the wedding that are not part of the bride. People that are attending the wedding. It's the guest of the wedding that is mentioned. And I believe that this, based on scriptural principles, is, is essentially what we would uh, call the family of God or uh, those that are not of the bride. They're saved individuals. However, they're not part of the bride of Jesus Christ. There's also potentially somebody said, and I don't know exactly where this fits in, but somebody said that there's a, uh, there's a possibility that the nation of Israel could be the bridesmaids. The bridesmaids. And I don't know if that's really the way it's going to play out. I know that Israel has a special place in, in, in the Lord's uh, uh, heart. And, and, and I do believe that when we look at the way these things are, there are saved Israelites. There are maybe some that will be, excuse me, part the, of the bride because they were part of those early churches. But there also might be a special place or privilege for them as part of this event, this marriage of the Lamb. And then that leads us to the last participant, and that is who? Good, the bride, for those of you that are paying attention, all right? The bride, the bride. Now, what do I believe? I believe, according to the scriptures, the bride is made up of the members of local biblical New Testament faithful churches. I believe that that's where you see uh, this, uh, this bride of Christ being drawn from, this bride of Christ being depicted. Again, as we talk about the role of John as the groomsman, he brought the saved, the baptized, the believers to Jesus Christ. And with those individuals, the Lord Jesus was able to start the very beginnings of the local New Testament church. And that has carried on even to the day that we live in, and I believe will be present at the rapture. <laughs> Uh, it's just the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ promised the, the perpetuity, if you will, of the local New Testament church. It will always exist as long as there before the rapture occurs. So in light of that and thinking about it, I want you to go over to Hebrews chapter 12. I think this is a good insightful scripture that can kind of help uh, show us a little bit, a little bit of why that there is a depiction between 
uh, the, the New Testament church versus just all of the saved. Uh, as we talk about this principle of the bride of Christ, there's a lot of different theories. There's a lot of different beliefs. Uh, there's uh, uh, some that believe it's made up of all the saved. There's some that believes it's made up of uh, just uh, the, uh, the church. There's some that believe it's made of just the faithful individuals. And, and there's, there's things that, 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 that uh, swirl around out there. As we see here in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22, it says this, But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And so what does that sound like? That sounds like the place that God took John uh, up to to show him uh, the bride, right? So the same area, the same dwelling place, all right? So uh, there in heavenly Jerusalem. Now, why do we look at the scripture? Because it tells us what there was in the heavenly Jerusalem. So here's the things that are listed. Uh, first of all, obviously location, Mount Zion, uh, New Jerusalem, that city. And then there's the innumerable company of angels. I like that word innumerable. You just can't number how many there are, right? And we know that there's the heavenly angelic beings that God created uh, at the beginning of creation. And a third of them rebelled, two thirds of them remained. And those are the servants of God. We call them angels. And so they are there in heaven. And then it talks about uh, to the general assembly. The general assembly, and I believe that this is simply referring to uh, the saved on uh, the saved individuals. Uh, that's the general assembly. One of the things that we know is a prerequisite to go to heaven is you must be saved. If you're not saved, you will not be in heaven. So this doesn't talk about lost people. This talks about saved people, and then it distinguishes from the general assembly. It says, "And church of the firstborn." So there is that, that reference to the local New Testament church, those that were a part of the uh, church. And, and, and when we say the church, we don't refer to that invisible uh, universal scenario that doesn't uh, really truly exist that people think, well, we're all a part of if we're saved. That's not biblical. That's always referred to and it's utilized the word church. It already always refers to a organized uh, group of visible baptized believers that are congregated for the purpose of carrying forth the Great Commission. And so here he distinguishes the general assembly, but also he distinguishes the church of the firstborn. That's why the word and is there. And when we see the next statement, it says, which are written in heaven. Are is the word that you would use is a plural sense, right? So there has to be more than one group. So there's the general assembly and there's the church of the firstborn. These are written in heaven. And then it mentions God, the judge of all, the spirits of just men, uh, referring to the Old Testament saints, and uh, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And so uh, Hebrews helps us to depict the, the different groups uh, grouping, if you will, of the saved in uh, heaven. Uh, there's also, as we mentioned, there's a difference between the family of God and uh, the church of God, right? Uh, uh, when you think about the family of God, we think about those are, that are saved. When you think about the church of God, we think about those that have committed themselves to baptism and membership of a local New Testament biblical church. And praise the Lord today. I mean, only God can put this together, right? We're preaching this subject, and we have two that are joining in through baptism. Cold or not. They're... I mean, that's wonderful. I just I love the way the Lord does it. I love the way that he, he, he works these things out. And so they're going to join our church, uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, based on the profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, being saved. And then because our church voted the authority of our church to add them to the membership of this church. And here's the, here's the kicker of it all. You know where that's going to be recorded? Not only in our church minutes, it's going to be recorded in heaven. Amen. And why is it necessary to be recorded in heaven? Because there's a special situation that occurs for those that are members of a local New Testament Bible-believing church. Uh, 
<coughs> excuse me, Genesis chapter 24, we see the example of Isaac and Rebekah. Isaac and Rebekah. I mean, one of the things that we uh, uh, see here is uh, Abraham sent his servant uh, to uh, find a wife for his son. And again, as we talk about the Jewish wedding style and the different stages, we can see that occur in that uh, situation. Uh, essentially, you can say that the servant was kind of like the best man. He went to secure the bride. He went to arrange the things, pay the dowry, uh, take care of it. We see Rebecca is that chaste virgin uh, that uh, she was uh, had prepared herself and she was ready for uh, Isaac. When in time came, we see the commission of the father. Uh, we see all of these things that, that happen and these things that occur. And one of the things I think is interesting to me is when Abraham sent his servant uh, to the family, he didn't bring the whole family back and say, okay, here's your bride. He brought one individual. He brought I, I, uh, Rebecca. <laughs> Because Isaac was already there, right? He brought Rebecca, and then she came, and, and then they were officially married, and then they celebrated uh, that marriage. And so uh, that's a, a, another example, I think, that helps us to truly uh, understand. Listen, I believe that the bride is those members of the local New Testament church. Now, one of the things that is a little bit hard to understand is when we get to heaven, how is he going to make all of that one? There's a lot of independent, local, biblical New Testament churches, right? There's some that have been, and there's some that maybe still will occur, depending on how long the rapture uh, takes place to happen. And yet, you know, the, the Lord has ways of working those kind of issues out. And so that's one of the things I put into his hands and let him take care of it. But you know, I think he knows each and every individual. He knows where they stand in relationship uh, to uh, his uh, uh, institution of the local church. Now, as we consider this will occur in heaven, it'll occur during uh, the tribulation, and it'll be right after that judgment seat of Christ, in which we will be that bride that is adorned and prepared for her husband. Now, I just gave you a whole lot of information. Is your head spinning? Are you ready to rejoice? Do you want to be a part of this event? Do you want to experience this situation? Let me give you some things that I think we must consider in regards to this particular event. First of all, the requirements. Salvation. You must be born again. One of the realities that we all must face is when it comes to the events of the end times, it is critical that you are saved. Can I tell you this, that not everyone is saved. Not everyone will get to experience the things that we've been talking about, the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, being with God forever, the marriage of the Lamb. So today, if you're not born again, if you're not a child of God, let me tell you, I just want to encourage you, you've got to start right there. Take care of that. Seek someone out. We would love to help you. We'd sit down and do a Bible study. We'll do whatever we can do to share with you the message of salvation from the standpoint of what God has written. And then after that, when we consider this aspect of the bride, another requirement is church membership. Church membership. Now, I realize that I'm moving over into thin ice in many people's eyes. Because what am I doing now? I'm isolating. I'm, I'm, I'm narrowing in to a specific group of saved individuals. Now for me, I, I, I kind of take after my father, so, so be it. <laughs> they accused him of being so narrow-minded that he could do what? See through a keyhole with both eyes at the same time, right? I mean, that just, listen, the scriptures are plain, the scriptures are true. Just because not everybody wants to buy into it or everybody wants to believe it doesn't mean they're not true sayings. 
So we got to consider here, what has the Lord really laid out for us that we need to understand? And one of the principles that I believe is a true principle that, 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 that really resides through the whole page of Scripture is this, is God rewards the faithfulness of His people. And not all His people are faithful. So yes, I do believe that there is special, if you want to call it privileges, rewards, or blessings, whatever you want to call it, I do believe that there's special things that God has set aside only for those that will be faithful in this life for Him. Being a member of a local New Testament church is a command that God has issued. It is something that everybody who is saved, they are to be baptized and then they are to join. Uh, through that baptism, they are to join a local New Testament church in which they are to have a pastor, in which they are to have a fellowship of believers, in which they are to have an entity in which to accomplish the Great Commission, in which they have a mechanism and able to be able to tithe and to give and to see the Lord's work done, in which they are able to have an entity, brothers and sisters, that will help them to maintain a pure and righteous life before God. People that will come up before beside them and say, listen, you know what? The way that you're living your life right now is unbiblical. It's not in accordance with God's word. And because you're a member of this church, we care about you and we love you and we want you to serve the Lord the way the Lord wants you to be. Uh, the Lord stated that we need to serve him. And boy, there's so many things wrapped up in just the doctrine of the local church. But this is, again, one of those areas that I believe is specially reserved for the members of a local New Testament church. And so, yes, if I have to state it clearly, if you're not a member of a local New Testament church, when the rapture occurs, you will not be a part of the bride of Christ. Ooh, I said that in love. And I said that in scripture. Why? Because that's what God has stated and what God desires to do to bless those that are faithful. And that doesn't mean that you won't go to heaven. It doesn't mean that you won't experience a whole lot of wonder, other blessings and rewards and things of that sort. But this is a special, special place, a special position that God has reserved for just that. Now, if we go to Ephesians chapter 5, and I'll try to get through this quickly, okay? Ephesians chapter 5, I'm not going to do marriage counseling this morning. Uh, that is for another session if you need it, all right? Uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves therefore unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Well, that sounds like I'm doing marriage counseling, but listen, today, if you're a member of this church, then you know what? You're part of the bride of Jesus Christ. There's responsibilities that come along with that. We must submit ourself to our groom. Submission in every day of his life, uh, every day of our life is part of our responsibilities. For the husband is the head of the wife. Now notice though, even as Christ is the head of the what? It doesn't say the saved, it says the church. The church, and he is the savior of the body. And you got to understand, again, define the word church there. Uh, don't look at it as some invisible uh, uh, universal group of all the saved. It's not the way the Bible defines it. It's an organized assembly of baptized believers that's visible. Okay, so that's who, that, that's who the, the scriptures put the groom, Jesus Christ, in relation to the bride, his church. And so as uh, that, we are to then submit to our, uh, our groom. We're to submit to his will. We're to allow our life to become his life. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ. Subject unto Christ, as he is the head, as he makes the decision, so let the wives be their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives. Now notice, even as Christ also loved the what? A church and gave himself for it. As he presented the dowry for our lives and paying with the blood, his own blood, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. There's our other responsibility is sanctification. Don't you want to be a clean bride? Don't you want to be pure before your groom? Aren't you looking forward to the time when he's like, whoa, what beauty. I see. I'm looking forward to it. 
This ought to be an opportunity for us to prepare for our groom, a time when we can be sanctified, but a time that we can be set apart from the world and the flesh and any other loves that might come into our life. We ought to be a chaste virgin, ready for our groom. No adultery ought to be part of our life. That's part of the responsibility looking forward to uh, this marriage event. It says in verse 27 that he might present it to himself at a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Again, pay attention to the wording of this passage of Scripture. This is something that will occur, that he may present it, right? As we talked about the different stages of a Jewish wedding, uh, the same thing occurs for us. We're in the spousal stage. We are engaged to our groom, uh, but, the, the, but the wedding is still yet to occur, okay? Let's look at it that way. We are preparing. We are getting ready for uh, that event uh, to happen. So we ought to separate from the world. We ought to make sure that there is no other loves. There's no other false grooms or any other immorality that might be occurring within our life or in uh, our hearts. Uh, he says, so what men to love their wives and their own body? He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. You know, Joseph cherished Mary before they were married. When they were spouse, what did he say? Not willing to make her a public example. He loved her so much that when she was found with child and he thought was because she had been unfaithful, he was going to put her away privately. But you know why he thought on these things? The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said, no, 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 don't worry about this, buddy. This is a special act of God. And then uh, you see, they, then eventually they are married and later on she has children and God blesses uh, their uh, family. You know, the Lord's doing the same thing for us. He's nourishing us, he's cheering us, cherishing us, and he's anticipating the marriage feast. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this call shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. We ought to have surrender. We ought to have full commitment. We ought to be His alone. And I'll leave you with this thought, the rewards of that relationship. Listen. You know, unlike any marriage that's ever occurred here on this earth, we're going to have an amazing husband who's perfect in all ways. I know some of you wives think you have an amazing husband. I know my wife does, but I have to shatter her dreams every once in a while, right? But our Savior will not. I mean, think, really, and this is what really the, the, the biggest blessing and weight of this message is really occurs right here. I get to be a spouse to an amazing husband. Do you know what kind of relationship that means I get to have with Jesus for all of eternity? Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. His bride. I mean, that's just, it, I just can't even fully comprehend it. But, but, but how about this one? An amazing home. An amazing home. And, and I, you know, I don't know all there is to know exactly about heaven and, and the dwellings of it. I know there's some things that talk about, you know, the, 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 the truly faithful ones will have a little bit uh, better opportunities in heaven than those that are not. And I know that there's some things that float around in regards to that. But, you know, one of the things I recognize, again, just from understanding this marriage of the Lamb, is those that are part of the bride are going to have a special dwelling place with the Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, it's not going to take away from the fact that heaven's going to be a wonderful place for all. But boy, I like to be a part of that faithful bride of Jesus Christ. Because in the end, what an amazing honor that will be. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. May that be our case. Anne Ross Cousin wrote a poem. She lived in, during the 1800s, passed away in the early 1900s. She said, the, the bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. 
I will not gaze at glory, but on my King of grace. Not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hand. The Lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. Father, this morning as we come before you. Lord, it's my desire that you truly use the message that you have provided me with to share this morning at this service as a means of encouraging each and every one of us in our relationship before you. And even more so in our relationship with our local New Testament church. Father, what a special privilege you've blessed us with to have a church, to be members of this church, to be a body, to be a building, but Lord, also to be a bride. And Father, I don't know exactly how it's all going to happen and occur in heaven, but it seems to me that the principles of your word are true and righteous. Lord, I pray for those that are not saved. May you draw them to yourself. Invite them to come. I pray for those, Father, that need to join the church. Maybe they need to be baptized. I pray that they would seriously consider that aspect of, again, responsibility before you and obedience to your word. And Lord, I pray for the members of local New Testament churches true churches, that you would help each and every one of us, Lord. And during this stage of preparation, Lord, we'll let you work mightily in and through our life and allow us to come together at that one point in time as a bride for your son. Encourage us today with the blessings of these things. Challenge our hearts and our actions. Lift our eyes up, Lord, beyond what we typically look at. And do the work that you've already begun. And this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?